Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle, AKA Stitcherista here on YouTube. And today is another face-to-face -face chat and true crime story time. <clears throat> the true crime story time today that we're going to read is called, If You Love Me, Kill Her. Hmm, spicy, right? But first we're gonna chat because we always chat. Yesterday's arbitration was, was difficult. Um, I'm just going to leave that right there, but yeah, everyone had a difficult time yesterday. Um, in a nutshell, the witness who was on the stand the whole day and the attorney just interrupted themselves a lot and it made, made it really difficult for us to get down and edit. And then just, of course, you know, when you're managing a team of six people, um, little things pop up, right? And then last night, I get an email from one of our team members who was supposed to work today. And this is at 7.50 p.m., mind you. And she says, can you have so, can you see if so-and-so can take my place tomorrow? At, at 7.50 p.m., you're letting me know this? So I messaged the other person. They're like, damn, if I would have known sooner, I would have canceled my appointment. They're like, I'm only available after lunch. I'm like, well, I'll take half a day help versus no help, right? And uh, I messaged two other people to see if they could fill in and they couldn't. Nobody's available. It's really hard when you're when you're messaging me the night before at 7:50 p.m. to find somebody for the next day. So I wrote her back and I said, "We only have somebody for half a day, but we'll manage, so I'll mark you off." And I said, "The person, the original person I had contacted said, you know, I'm available Wednesday and Friday for a full day if need be." And so I wrote this person back and I said, "Look, do you want me to get this other person Wednesday and Friday?" I said, that way you would only be committed to us for Thursday. And I said, because I'm, I'm going to be honest and say, it really puts us in a bind when I find out this late at night that you can't work the next day because having three people for this arbitration instead of four editing, it's going to put more stress on, on those three people. So she's like, no, I only need off tomorrow. Okay. Like, I really hope that's true. You know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, uh, right? So I messaged my boss and I'm like, look, it's only going to be three of us in the morning, which, yeah. And I also messaged the team to say, hey, it's only going to be three of us up until the lunch break. I said, so we're just going to have to manage the best that we can. Um, yeah. So today should be, oh, and my boss, you know, this is, this is what I love. She's like, well, you can catch up at the lunch break. Well, no, not that I wanted to take a fucking lunch break, right? No, I don't need a lunch break. What? <laughs> I was just like, okay. And I, told, and I was sitting there messaging because Bill was sitting next to me when I found out and he was like, oh God. Yeah. Okay, so I did stitch last night, so if you watch my vlog on Saturday, you'll see I made pretty decent progress. But yesterday, Bill had to go to the grocery store because they are doing a Thanksgiving at his work, and he is always in charge of the turkey, although he complains every year about doing it, but he doesn't ever pass it on to anybody else to do. He calls me, and he's like, um, the grocery store just gave me a free Thanksgiving dinner. I'm like, what? They were giving out coupons for a free Thanksgiving dinner. He brought home pumpkin pie, a turkey. He brought home all this stuff. He said they were giving away like toys. Now these are dog toys. But I said, these are too nice to give to a puppy. <laughs> um, so they are going to appear in videos. Oh, they are my friends now. So first we have Tootsie Pop. Because doesn't he look like the owl from the Tootsie Pop commercials? Yeah, they all have squeakers in them. Well, we don't even have any dogs anymore. I would have given one to my dog. But oh my God, are they not so cute? I love stuffed animals. Tootsie Pop. 
Hank. Ah! Is he not the cutest little thing you ever saw? Yeah, Hank. And finally, we have Snowball. He's a cutie, too. So, they all like true crime. <laughs> I need that laugh today. They all like true crime, so they will be making their little appearances during stories. So, they're going to, Hank and Snowball are going to sit off to the side, and Tootsie Pop is going to sit with me while I read this story. So, yeah, he came home, and he knows I like all this kind of stuff, like stuffed animals, and uh, it doesn't matter that I'm 47 years old. I love this stuff, right? Okay, so Tootsie Pop, are you ready? He's ready. So, the story today, if you love me, kill her. Hmm. Okay. This was one of the easiest cases that the police in Garden Grove, California, had ever had to solve. The victim, 23-year-old Linda Brown, lay sprawled across her bed, shot twice in the chest. Dude. Brutal, right? Oh, Tootsie Pop, I hope you don't mind me cussing. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. The murder weapon, a thirty-eight caliber revolver belonging to Linda's husband, David, lay on the floor, but David Brown was not the shooter. Really? I know. <laughs> he had been in a nearby convenience store at the time the shots were fired. The perpetrator was in the backyard, curled into a fetal position inside a doghouse. What? She was unconscious, drenched in her own vomit and urine, the result of an apparent suicide attempt by overdose. Clenched in her fist was a note, Dear God, please forgive me. I didn't mean to hurt her. Cinnamon Brown. Wow, that's a cool name. The suspected shooter was just 14 years old and she was Linda's stepdaughter. Oh, God. On the face of it, this looked like a classic case of intrafamily conflict between a stepmother and the child of an earlier marriage. I'm here to tell you. Stepchildren, ex-wives, all of that. Not always easy to navigate. Um... You know, I've been with Bill now for going almost 13 years. There have been some moments. It's it's not easy when you're blending families, essentially. And, you know, I've never had kids of my own. And yeah, I get it. Okay. Indeed, David Brown and Patty Bailey, Linda's 18-year-old sister, who also lived in the house, confirmed that Linda and Cinnamon did not get along and were always at each other's throats. Ugh, that can make for a very tense household. Friends and acquaintances, though, told a different story. They said the two had gotten along just fine. Well, you can put up, you can put on a front, right, to people outside of your immediate family. So that was the first indication that things might not be as they seemed. Those concerns, however, did not make their way into the courtroom. Cinnamon, after all, was not denying the shooting, so there was probably no trial. Why would there be? She admitted the murder, although she claimed that she had blacked out and could not remember pulling the trigger. There's obviously much more to this story because it's like five more pages. That, according to her attorney, qualified as temporary insanity. He urged the jury to go easy on his client, who was just a misguided child who had made a mistake, but the jury was not in a forgiving mood and neither was the judge. Found guilty of murder in September of 1986, Cinnamon was sentenced to 27 years to life and shipped off to the California Youth Authority to begin serving her sentence. Oh, shit. Right, Tootsie Pop? Yeah. Um, so she's 14, 27. Minimum, she'll be in her 40s when she gets out of prison. But to one investigator in the district attorney's office, something about this case just didn't sit right. Jay Newell had seen his fair share of juvenile offenders and knew that some of them could be just as belligerent as adults. Cinnamon Brown did not fit comfortably into that mold. She was placid and docile. She hardly seemed capable of the crime she had admitted to. Hmm, I'm thinking Cinnamon didn't do it. 
And so Newell decided to do some digging. He started looking into the background of David Brown, Cinnamon's father, and soon made some startling discoveries. The first was that Brown appeared to have quickly gotten over his wife's brutal death. He had since cashed in an $835,000 life insurance policy and was living the lifestyle. Get the fuck out of here. $835,000? Woo! That's a chunk of change. He had bought himself a sports car and a luxury villa in Anaheim Hills. Oh! <laughs> he had also remarried. Get ready. Get ready, Tootsie Pop. Tying the knot with his former sister-in-law, Patty, while his daughter was still on trial for murder. What? Patty was, in fact, Brown's sixth wife. Dude, there's no fucking way in hell I would ever be married um, six times. Fucking kill me now. Um, Bill was my second marriage, and I already am like, Oh my God, like I can't imagine being married six times. How do you do that six times? Mm. So the scrawny, balding, and vertically challenged Brown seemed to have a way with women. Maybe he has some good china, if you know what I mean. Right, Tootsie Pop? <laughs> okay, my nose, it keeps running. But neither Brown's marital record nor his cavalier attitude in the aftermath of his wife's death were indicative of anything untoward. Although Newell remained convinced that there was more to the Brown case, he knew that he would never prove it without Cinnamon's help. The problem was that the teenage killer was still adamant that she had acted alone and could remember nothing of the actual shooting. And it was a stance she would maintain for the next two years. Mm. So she must be in prison thinking... Why am I taking the rap for this, right? In 1998, however, Cinnamon decided to come clean. Here we go. The real story, right? Perhaps it was a pang of conscience or perhaps it was the idea of her father living it up while she languished in jail. Yeah, no. More than likely, it was the realization that her father had manipulated her and had also tried to kill her. Whatever the reason, she asked for a meeting with the authorities and spilled the beans. It was as Jay Newell had suspected all along, Cinnamon had not acted alone. This was a murder plot orchestrated by David Brown and also involving Patty Bailey. But of course it did. Because he married her soon after the other wife's death. Yeah. So according to Cinnamon... The plot had initially been formed in 1983 when David called her and Patty aside and told them that he believed Linda and her twin brother were plotting to kill him and take control of his business. Okay. He had then suggested that they strike first, killing Linda before she killed him. He would do it himself, he said, but he was too sickly to pull it off. Really? Besides, a court would go far easier on one of them. Really? <laughs> Due to their age, they would probably get no more than probation. But she didn't. She got 27 years to life, you big freaking dummy. Brown's plea had made an impression on the teens. Cinnamon, in particular, was affected by her father's plight. She loved him intently and was horrified by the prospect of losing him to an act of violence. And if she wasn't yet convinced to come on board with this murder plot, the next words out of his mouth swayed her. If you really love me, you'll do this, he told the impressionable teen. Don't ever say that to your children or your spouse or... In kidding, maybe, but no. So after that, both Cinnamon and Patty were in. However, it was Cinnamon who David instructed to carry out the shooting since she was a juvenile and would thus face the lightest sentence if caught. Cinnamon's probably like, why the fuck am I serving this sentence when you dumb fucks also were a part of it? Right, Tootsie Pop? Yeah, he agrees. On the night of March 18th, 1985, Cinnamon was woken by her father and told it has to be done tonight. Great! He then pressed a gun into her hand and also gave her a handful of pills, which he told her to take before shooting her stepmother. Oh, he told her to take the pills. 
He assured her that the pills would knock her out but would not kill her. It would make it look like she had attempted suicide after shooting Linda. That would show remorse and would play well with the jury. He then told her to wait until he left the house before going to the master bedroom and shooting Linda while she slept. Jesus. Cinnamon, just 14 years old and devoted to her father, followed the instructions to the letter. First, she swallowed the pills. Then she walked quickly to the bedroom and stood over her stepmother. Raising the 38, she took aim at Linda's torso and tightened her finger on the trigger. The boom of the revolver was very loud in the small room, and it woke Linda's baby, just seven months old, who started crying. Really? My God, she has a seven-month-old baby? Linda, hit in the chest, was gurgling, coughing up blood, struggling to breathe. Cinnamon raised the gun again and pulled off another shot, which also found its mark in her stepmother's chest, and this time Linda lay still. I bet she did. By now... Cinnamon was feeling the effects of the pill she had taken. She felt woozy and nauseous. The room felt as though it was spinning. Her stomach was churning, trying to reject the remnants of her last meal. Dropping the gun, she stumbled out into the passage through the kitchen, out into the yard where she collapsed beside the doghouse. Instinctively, she dragged herself in, curled up into a ball, her chest heaving. That doghouse must have been pretty big for her to be able to get in it. In the next moment, she threw up, ejecting many of the pills undissolved, so that probably saved her life. Then it all went black. She was still in the same spot when the police found her. Cinnamon Brown had been lucky. Oh, and another piece of the puzzle falls into place. Tootsie Pop. Yeah. Throwing up had saved Cinnamon's life because the pills that her father had given her had not been intended to knock her out. They had been intended to kill her. He didn't... How was he going, oh, he was just going to say, oh, she killed my wife, and then she committed suicide because she was too distraught. Case closed, done. It was an interesting story, but one that investigators could not take on face value. After all, Cinnamon had good reason to deflect the blame. If it could be proved that she had been manipulated into killing her stepmother, she might be looking at a reduction in her sentence. The details needed to be verified, and the one person who could do that was Patty Brown. Approached by investigators and offered a deal, Patty agreed to talk, and she confirmed everything Cinnamon told him. Hmm. But Patty went even further than that. Oh, snap. She told the police how David Brown had wormed his way into her family. Patty was one of 11 siblings living with their single mother. Good God! What?! You have 11 children? How do you even manage that? How do you do that? After David Brown moved in next door, he got to know the family and he took a shine to Linda. He told them that he was dying of cancer and convinced some of the girls to care for him and clean his house. Wow, this is a stand-up person. He then started dating Linda and they eventually got married. They would later divorce and then remarry. I have heard so many people do that. I can't imagine remarrying my first husband. No. By that time, the couple was living in Garden Grove with Cinnamon also in the household. Seeking to escape her crowded family home, Patty had asked if she could live with them, and David had said yes. Soon after she moved in, he started visiting her at night. Oh, no! Wow! Wow! She submitted to him because she had low self-esteem and because he told her that he loved her. And that was the same reason that she agreed to participate in the murder plot. Oh, my skin like crawled when I read that. The cops were now ready to move on David Brown, but first they needed some solid evidence against him. To obtain that evidence, they asked Cinnamon to wear a wire the next time he visited and get to get him to admit on tape that Linda's murder was his idea. Cinnamon was willing to cooperate, and her father all too easily fell into the trap. It took very little prompting from his daughter before he was openly discussing the murder and his role in it. Little did he know that every word was being recorded. Arrested and charged with murder and conspiracy to commit murder, David Brown played true to type. First, he tried to blame Patty, saying that she had wanted Linda dead so that she could have him for herself. Yeah, you know he's going to blame everybody else. 
When that didn't work, he tried to recruit a fellow inmate to kill Patty and two members of the DA's staff. Really? Unfortunately, the inmate, inmate, turned out to be an undercover cop earning Brown another conspiracy charge. You big freaking dummy. When he eventually went on trial, he was sentenced to life in prison. He would serve 24 years before dying behind bars in 2014 of undisclosed natural causes. At least he was off the streets. As for the other key players, Patty spent four years in prison and married one of her guards on her release. Okay. Cinnamon walked free in 1992, having served seven years. So when she got out, she was 21. She has since tried to keep a low profile, but that has not been easy with the case continuing to generate publicity. It has been the subject of two books and a TV miniseries. Have you guys seen any of that or read the books? Cinnamon would also have to endure further tragedy when her husband committed suicide. That poor girl. Oh my God. Wow. Right, Tootsie Pop? Yeah. She has had some shit happen to her. That poor girl. Wow. Yeah, I, you know, I've seen a lot of ma like made for TV movies, but I haven't seen a lot of true crime stuff. Like my mom and I used to watch the Monday night movie that would come on. But I haven't watched like hardly any of these. The only one I really saw was like Betty Broderick. That's it. I didn't, I haven't seen any of this stuff and I didn't read the books. Okay. So let me know down below what you think of my little friends. <laughs> and have you heard of this story before? So as always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing and I, and maybe Tootsie Pop, will see you in my next video. Bye guys.